All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, appreciate everybody who's tuning in right now. Just right now, we got 10 people already tuning in, so we got a good little crowd, and it's just seven o'clock, so that's a good thing. Once again, text your comments or your questions to the, the number that's on the screen, 405 481 4453, or create an account with your Facebook login and um, or just go ahead and create an account the normal way so you can get uh, get to participate in the discussion all right it may be blurry depending upon um, the internet speed or the speed of uh, your computer it's not blurry on my end but um, let me just check something right, right quick. Make sure the quality is, is set high. Okay, I got the quality set kind of high. So if it looked blurry, I apologize. It may be, um, <clears throat> it may be an internet connection or something. Internet connection is good on my end. If if you can see my picture, if you can see our picture pretty good, then send me a message or a chat message or, or something and let me know how it's looking on your end so I know. I just got one message that said it was just just a little blurry. <clears throat> but in the meantime, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our study tonight. I got my whole family sitting right here. Jennifer, Alexis, Madison, and little T right here uh, is on the iPad, hoping that can keep him busy while we're doing the, the study tonight. If you didn't get to see the questions, I, I posted 11 questions on Facebook. And I also sent some out with text messages. These are going to be the questions that we're going to be answering tonight about the lesson. And the lesson, the topic of the lesson, and the first thing on the sheet is to write the topic down. And the topic of the lesson tonight is how do you respond to troubles uh, in life? How do you respond to troubles in life? Okay, I thought it would be a good discussion, and one of the reasons I thought it would be a good discussion is because everybody goes through something. We all have bad situations that happen in our lives. Some of you all may be going through something right now. You may be dealing with something. It could be anything. It could be financial hardship that you may be going through. It could be relationship problems you may be going through. It could be problems with your children. It could be problems on your job. It could be problems right in your community. It could be problems with your relatives. It could be anything that you could be going through, the loss of a loved one. But when you look at these problems and these bad situations that we all have, everybody responds to them in a different way. Everybody responds in a different way. You may have two different people who go through the exact same thing and one person may handle it good and the other person may hey. become hey. the other person may come to become destroyed by what just happened to them. Now why is that? Because everybody's faith is different. Everybody is on a different level when it comes to dealing with that type of stuff in their lives. And you know, we look at people sometimes who break in the midst of trials, and we look at them and we think bad of them, but most of the time, they're not, I mean, it's just that they're not strong. Everybody emotionally is geared different. But with the study tonight, I want to try to offer you three three things, three ways to respond to problems that you face in life. That's going to be the first question. I mean, well, it's really not a question, but on the number one, it says, name three ways we can respond to the troubles that we face in life. Three ways that we respond to trouble that we face in life. The first way is we pray. 
That's the first thing. We pray. Prayer is very, very important. And after I list these three things, we're going to talk about each one of them. So number one is pray. Number two is worship. Worship is very important also. I'll tell you why. So we pray. We worship. And then the last one, number three, is stay away from pessimism or don't be negative. Don't be negative. Okay? Very important. Don't be negative. Can anybody here tell me what it means to be negative? Y'all you know what it means to be negative? Say something bad. Huh? Say something bad. Okay. Well, yeah, you can say something bad. That that could be considered negative. What else? Always find the bad in every issue or thing. All right. Always find something bad. In everything that goes on, you never find anything good. So that's what it means to uh, focus in on the negative or being a pessimist or focusing on pessimism. So those are three things that we're going to talk about tonight, three responses that you have toward things that you go through in life. Okay. Number one, pray. Number two, worship. And number three, stay away from negative thoughts. Okay. So let's look at prayer first. Okay. What, who, what, what, what do we pray? I mean, how do you pray? Who, who do you pray to? God. You pray to God. First thing we do, we pray. We pray to God. Prayer is very, very important, okay? Turn your Bibles, and you need your Bibles. I told you you need your Bibles, you need some paper, and you need something to write with. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. And I'm going to be turning right here with you. I got my Bible. I got my paper. Of course, I already got the answers, but I'll be turning, and we'll be reading along together. 1 Peter chapter 5. At verse number seven. Don't forget, send me your questions, send me your comments, whatever it is you have, send them to me so I can read them on uh, read them online. First Peter five verse seven. By the way, welcome to our living room. Call this call this living room study. All right, First Peter five and verse number seven. All right, uh, Alexis, read that for me. Testing all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So number two says, where are we told to bring our cares? Or where are we told to bring our burdens? Where are we told to bring our cares and burdens? What is that verse? Upon him? Father. Yeah, who is him? God. God. Yes, God. We are supposed, and when, and when, we go, when you're going through something, the first place to go is not to a person. The first place to go is not to, to, to the preacher, not to, to the elder, not to the members, not to your parents, not to your grandparents, not to your friend, your best friend. The first place to go is to God. He's always the first place to go. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, that's where we bring our burdens. That's where we bring our care. We bring them and we leave them at the feet of God. Okay? That's, that's so important when we're responding to adversities that we're going through in life. Okay? Now, Jesus realized that as we go through different things in life, they're gonna, there's going to come a time where, you know, you pray. How many of you ever prayed and you prayed and you prayed and it seemed like nothing ever happened? The situation never got better. Nothing ever changed. And you begin to feel like God wasn't listening. And you begin to say to yourself, well, I'm going to stop praying because it doesn't look like it's helping my life, so I might as well stop praying. I've done it. I've done it plenty of times. Yeah, I think everybody has done it, and uh, I think it's a natural reaction because as human beings, we want something done and we want it done right then. And if it's not done right then, we're impatient. But we've got to be patient and we've got to be persistent. Turn over to Luke chapter 18, and let's look at a story that Jesus told about prayer. And I know Jesus understood the, that temptation to give up on life, to give up on prayer, to give up on God, to give up on him. He understood the temptation. 
You know, Jesus understood because he went through a lot of stuff himself. And even though he never gave up, he understood how hard it was and how easy the temptation was to give up. So he told his story about prayer in Luke chapter 18. And we're going to look at chapter 18, verse 1 through 7. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 through 7. Okay, we're going to read verse 1 first. Madison, read verse 1 first. And he spoke or spake, spake a parable. Parable unto this, to this end that man ought, ought always to pray and not to faint. Okay, so, so Jesus spoke a parable about prayer. And he told them that when you pray, don't ever lose heart or don't ever faint. Now, why would Jesus tell us to pray and don't faint or don't lose heart? Why, why do y'all think Jesus would say, pray, but don't lose heart? Let's put your collar down. Why do y'all think he would say that? Pray. He's basically saying pray and don't give up. Don't stop praying. Why do y'all think he would say something like that? Anybody? Well, I think of a scripture, pray without ceasing. And he well, tells us not to stop praying. Well, I know that. I, I know he tells us that. And I know First Thessalonians 5, 17 says pray without ceasing. But the question is, why would he tell us to pray without ceasing? Why would he tell us to pray and not lose heart? That's the question. What if I tell you to... Try to jump over this house, but don't lose heart. Don't give up. Why would I tell you don't give up? Because you know it'll be hard. Yeah, because I know it's going to be hard. The reason why Jesus says pray and don't give up, because he knows it's going to be hard to accept the fact that the answers to our prayers may not come the way we want it and in the timing that we want. He understood that. Okay, so he says, pray and don't lose heart. And listen to this story that he gives about this widow. I'm going to start reading to verse 2, Luke 18, verse 2. Let, before we do that, let's look at verse number 3. Uh, let's answer the question, verse 3. It says, what does Jesus tell us not to do when praying? The answer to that question is lose heart. Don't lose heart. Okay, very important. Don't give up. All right, now beginning in verse number two, here, here's the parable. There was a certain, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regarded man. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me and my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her. Unless by her continuing coming, she weary me. Jesus tells this story of this woman who wanted revenge for, uh, against her adversaries. And the judge, the judge basically didn't pay her any attention. Okay? And so uh, she kept coming, she kept coming, she kept coming, she kept coming. And he finally said, oh, I, gotta, I can't take it. I've got to go ahead and do something because if I don't do anything, she's going to keep coming. She's going to keep coming. She's going to keep coming. So the judge gave in, not because he feared God, not because he feared this woman. He gave in because of her persistence, because she kept coming and she kept coming and she kept coming. And so Jesus, he talks about prayer in the same way. In, uh, in the next verse, in verse number six, I mean, verse seven, he says, and shall not God not judge? And shall God not judge or avenge his own who cry day and night to him? So he basically, Jesus yeah. basically saying this right here. If this unjust judge gave in to this woman because of her persistence, then don't you know that God, who is just, would give in to us if we cry to him day and night? Yes, that's persistence, okay? Persistence. And it's very important in our prayer life because it's easy to give up when things are not going uh, the way we think it ought to go, okay? So, number four, the question is this. 
What point was Jesus trying to make by telling the story of the widow and the unjust judge? And here's the answer. That our prayer life should be persistent. That our prayer life should be persistent. That our prayer life should be persistent. All right, that our prayer life should be persistent. All right, now let's move on to verse five. I mean, to number five. It says, what was Jesus' emotional condition when he prayed to his father? What was his emotional condition when he prayed to his father? The reason why I put this question down is because I've been asked before, well, what if I'm praying and and I'm crying, or I'm upset, or I'm mad, I'm angry, you know, does, does God accept my prayer when I'm like that? And the, answer my, and the answer to that question is yes, you know. That's why we pray, because of our emotional state. Yes, we pray to God to thank him for the things that he's done for us. We thank him for the blessing. But we also thank God when, we, when we're in trouble, when we need him. And most of the time, when we're in trouble and when we need God, we're in emotional, we're in an emotional state. And the reason why that's so good to pray to God like that is because sometimes your emotional state can make you say and do things that will cause you harm in the long run. So instead of acting out of emotion when you get mad and angry and upset, you pray to God and try to help relieve some of those emotions that you have. It's never wrong with having emotions, as we'll see in just a, a moment. Y'all ever been mad? Yeah, why y'all look at each other, figure that out. <laughs> Have you ever been mad, Little T? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, sir? Yeah. Okay, all right. You ever been mad? Yes. All right. <laughs> okay, so yes, everybody gets mad, everybody gets upset, everybody gets sad. Nothing wrong with that. And you're going to see from the verses that we're getting ready to read about Jesus that he had the same emotional state when he prayed to God in tough, tough, tough times. Look at Luke chapter 22, beginning with verse 39. Luke 22, beginning with verse 39. Don't forget, send me your questions and your comments so I can get those read online. Luke chapter 22. Luke 22. And we're going to start at verse 39. Okay. Notice what it says. Coming out. Shh, hey, hush. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives. And as he was accustomed uh, with his disciples, they also followed him. And when he had come to the place, he said to them, pray that you do not enter into temptation. And then when he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, he knelt down and he prayed. Saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he arose up from prayer and his disciples had come to him, he, I mean, and he had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, why are you asleep? Rise, lest you fall and to temptation. So we see from this verse here, Jesus was praying and he was in such agony in his prayer that God had to send an angel from heaven down here to get him strength. That's what you call a person that's in a weak state. That's what you call a person that has reached that, that point in their life to where they can, be, they can get no weaker. Jesus reached that point in his life to where his troubles got the best of him. Now, he didn't give up. No, he didn't give up like we do as humans sometimes. And he was human too, but still, we, we're different in, in, in a sense than Jesus was because, you know, Jesus knew what his focus was. He, I, he knew what his duty was. He knew what he came to do. He came for one purpose, to die. He knew that. And he knew that once that purpose was served, 
That was it. We're a little different. Unlike Jesus, even though that, that should be our focus, that may be our focus, but we have a lot of other focuses as well. We have families. We have relationships. We have jobs. We have this. We have that. And sometimes we lose sight of what the true focus is because we begin to be consumed by life. You know, have you ever uh, went one or two days without praying because you were so consumed in your life? And, uh, and you said, man, I didn't pray. Have you ever sat down to eat? And before you uh, started eating, you, you went and took that first bite and you forgot, oh, I need to bless my food, you know. I, I think it's just we, we just lose focus sometimes. And those are just simple illustrations. But the reason why I said that is to show you that sometimes we just lose focus when it comes to life. And, and Jesus knew what his focus was. He knew what he came to do. And he knew he, he did not come to this earth to spend any time down here longer than what he needed to do. He came here to die, and when he died, he was going back to heaven, and he wasn't going to let anything stop him from the love he had for us. He wasn't going to let anything stop him from giving himself as a sacrifice on our behalf because he loved us so much. You know, the love he had for us kept him going. And, you know, with us, you know, we don't have that same focus in life when it comes to the goal of trying to get to heaven, you know, we, we get distracted a lot of times and, and, and I don't know, it's just, I had that question asked to me sometimes and, and the question was, well, how could Jesus be perfect and we can't be perfect? And, and I've heard this answer given that I just disagree with. I've heard the answer given, well, Jesus was, you know, half God. That's why he, I disagree with that totally. Jesus was a human just like us. The Bible says he was tempted in every, every area just like us. But he was strong enough not to give in. And I think it all had to do with the focus. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says he looked at what was ahead of him. Because what was ahead of him, the Bible says he endured everything he went through because he looked to what was ahead of him. We could do the same thing if we stay focused on what was ahead of what is ahead of us, but we lose focus sometimes on things that are ahead of us because of what we're going through at that very moment. Turn to Hebrews chapter I threw a lot of that in there, you know, but still, I, I think it's good to understand sometimes uh, that Jesus went through the same thing you and I went through, uh, you and I go through. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5, and let me show you a verse that talks about Jesus when he was praying. And um, and let me show you how much so he was like you and I when we face in tough times. Hebrews 5, verse number 7. <clears throat> All right, Hebrews 5, 7. Uh, <clears throat> you got that, Sister L? Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death and was hurt because of his godly fear. You see that? Jesus cried during his days while on the earth. He cried, he had tears, and his prayers were so fervent that it's described here as vehement prayers. He had the same emotions you and I have in prayer. And that's why when you're going through something, it doesn't matter about the emotions. What matters is the first thing you do in response to what you're going through is you get down on your knees and you call on your father. That's why he's there. Okay. When my children are in trouble, they come to daddy. When we're in trouble as children of God, we go to our father as well. Number one, we pray. Okay. So number five says, what was Jesus' emotional condition when he prayed to his father? The answer is he was in agony with tears. He was in agony with tears. He was in agony with tears. All right. He was in agony with tears. Okay, we're going to move to the second response. And the second response, you may, you may be wondering why it's a response. And the second thing that we talked about in number one was worship. When you're going through something, 
It's not the time to move away from God. When you're going through something, that's the time to come close to God. And that includes worshiping God. Have you ever been at a congregation or have you ever seen somebody when they start going through something, they start missing services or, or their whole life begins to change because they've moved away from God? That's why it's so important because when you move away from God, that's when your life begins to change for the worse. When you're going through something, pray and you move to God in worship. Okay? Very, very important. Number six says, what does worshiping God in difficult times show? What does worshiping, y'all think y'all know the answer to that question? When we go through something bad, when we worship God, what does that show about us? Or what does that say about our attitude? Or what does that say about our relationship with God? I mean, what does that say? If you're going through something, but you still are willing to worship God, does that say anything about the person? If they have faith. Yeah, they have faith. Anything else? <laughs> um, you're persistent. All right, you're persistent? Okay, here's what I have. It shows we are trusting and depending upon God because of his goodness and faithfulness to us in the past. It shows we're trusting and depending upon God because of his goodness and faithfulness to us in the past. You see, somebody who's always there for me, who's always, who's never let me down, I trust them. I can depend on those individuals. But somebody who's let me down or who hurt me or who lied to me or something like that, I'm a little hesitant. I still may build up a little trust in the long run, but I'm still a little hesitant. The good thing about God is he never, ever has let anybody down. If you're watching right now, God ain't let you down. You still have your health and strength or some of it. You have clothes. You have somewhere to lay your head. You're still living. Even if you are not living, it doesn't mean God let you down, you know. Uh, but still, God has blessed you to make it this far. He did that for a reason. He's allowed that for a reason. Maybe there's a purpose for you in your life. I don't know. But... Uh, because of God's goodness and because of his faith, faithfulness, because of his grace and because of his mercy, he allows us to be blessed in certain ways, not just physically, but monetarily, spiritually, and emotionally, whatever the case may be, God blesses us. And because of that, we trust and we depend on him. And we show that when we worship. When we go and worship God while we're going through something bad, we're showing God, I trust you. Okay. God, I trust you. All right. Number seven says, give two examples of people who worship God while going through difficult times. The first person is David. David, and you can write the verses down in just a second. David, and that's 2 Samuel chapter 12, 15 through 20. David. 2 Samuel chapter 12, 15 through 20. Got me some sweet tea in my cup. Alabama cup. All right, let's turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 12 and let's look at David's response to difficult times. All right. Verse 15. By the way, just to set the stage right here, this is when Nathan, you know, David got, David killed Uriah, uh, Uriah, um, Uzziah, I think it, my mind just went blank, the husband of Bathsheba, just to have her. They had a child, and so God sent Nathan the prophet to David to pretty much condemn David for what David did. So Nathan told David everything he needed to tell David, and uh, and David now has a guilty conscience, and Nathan is getting ready to leave. So in verse number 15, it says, then Nathan departed, oh yeah, by the way, and God said he's going to kill the child. 
So verse 15 says, Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's, uh, Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. David then pleaded and begged God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So David, while this baby was sick, David prayed to God. He begged God, God, please spare the life of my, my child. But God was not going to go back on his word. God told David, I'm going to take the life of the child. So the child died. Watch what happens after David learns the child had died. Look in verse 18. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Now watch verse 20. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and watch this, went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house. You see that? David lost a child. David lost his child, and instead of David going home, crying on the couch or going in his bedroom, crying in his bed, instead of David going to one of his friend's house to cry, the first place David went was to the house of the Lord to worship, and then he went home. That's how you respond to adversity. That's how you respond to, thing, to things that you go through in life. You go to God and you worship God, then you go home. Why? Because that's where you get your strength from. Worship, worship edifies and builds us up and gives us the necessary strength we need to make it through the things that we're going through. When you stay away from worship, you stay away from God. And when you stay away from God, you stay away from the very thing that can give you the charge you need to continue moving. It's very important. It's like one of these new cars that run off a battery that I would never buy. Because I'm scared that it's going, the battery's going to go dead on me in the middle of I-20. But those cars, if they stay away, and they run out of the little gas they have, if they stay away from the charge, they're going to go dead. They, have to, they, they need recharging. And once they get to that recharging spot, get that energy back. And worship, a worship is, Andrea Seawright sent me a message. She said, amen, with uh, three exclamation points. <laughs> So you need that recharging in order to make it through. And if you don't get that recharging, then it's going to be very, very difficult to get through the problems that you face. Okay? So worshiping is very important. Let's look at the second example. Another famous guy that you all know. His name is Job. Okay? Y'all know Job? Do y'all what, what's Do y'all know what Job is famous for? Yes, or some sir. things that happened to Job? Yes, sir. Yeah? Well, how do y'all know him? Did y'all see him at Walmart or something? No, sir. <laughs> All right, let's turn over to Joe chapter did. one. You did. Oh, okay. Leticia, he saw him at Walmart. Okay, let's turn over to Job chapter one. And uh, and let's look at some verses here. Now, in verse 13, now remember, this is Satan. He went to God. He, he told God he had been traveling around trying to destroy people, in my own words. And, uh, and then the Lord said to him, have you tried my servant Job? Basically, God was telling him this right here. Well, you may have been going around trying to destroy people's lives, and you may have been successful in destroying people's lives, Satan. But have you tried my servant Job? Because ain't nobody like him anywhere. And Satan said, well, stop protecting him. You stop protecting him, and I'll make him break. And that's when Satan began the rampage in, into Job's life to try to destroy everything around him. And in verse 13, it says, uh, actually from verse 13 all the way down to verse 19, is when Satan begins the attack. He destroys everything that Job has. He kills Job's daughters. Well, I say he killed him, but he had to be behind the storm because he got permission from God to hurt Job's life. Uh, um, uh, not his physical life, but the things that were part of his life. And so, and, and the next thing that happens is a, 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 a wind, a tornado or something, came and, and kills his daughters and his sons. 
So however that happened, Satan was behind him. Job lost the very people in his life that he loved. Now, he could have done a couple of things. Number one, he could have got mad at God. He could have got mad at God, and he could have blamed God, and he could have said, Lord, I've been faithful to you. I've been here for you. I've never done, I never turned my back on you, and this is how you repay me? I'm tired of living for you, God. If this the only thing that you're going to do is just it, it, it send hardship in my life, why did you allow a good person to suffer? I'm sick of it. He could have said that. Don't y'all think he could have said that? Yes, sir. Uh, y'all just saying that because I'm y'all dad? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But he could have said that. And he could have said, Lord, I'm tired of serving you. I'm turning my back. I don't ever want to see you again. Could have said that, but he didn't. Let me show you what he did. Look at verse eight and verse 20. Verse 20. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and did what? Worshipped. Worshipped. Worship. What? I found a lot of important stuff in this verse right here. I find emotions. He tore his clothes. He was upset. He, he was angry. Shaved his head. But in all of that, in all of that, verse 22 says, In all of that, Job did not sin, nor charge God with the wrong. In all of this that he went through, in all of his anger, in all of his, his, his him being frustrated and upset and, and, and sad and mad, in all of this, he never one time sinned or he never accused God that it was God's fault. And that's what we have to realize. When troubles come into our life, it's not God. It's not God's fault that that stuff is coming into our life. A lot of times, troubles that come into our life are things that we create, things that people create for us, natural disasters. Anything like that. But it doesn't mean God is intentionally bringing hardships into our lives just to, just to, I don't believe God tests people with evil. I don't believe that. You know, you may say, well, he let Satan, okay, but who did it? God let Satan do it, but who did it? Did God, was God just sitting around one day and said, you know what? Uh, I think I'll just go, Satan, come here. I got somebody I want you to go destroy. No, he didn't do that. Satan came to God. Okay? And God has so much faith in Job, God says, okay, try him. And you know what? In our lives, when we're going through tough times, God may be looking at us saying the same exact thing. Have you tried my servant Tony? Have you tried my servant Jennifer, Alexis, Madison? Have you tried my servant Andrea? Have you tried whoever you are that's watching? God may be looking down from heaven saying, say, have you tried them? Because I know they're not going to break. And that's something to think about. Okay? So we have two examples of people who worship God in the midst of trouble. David and Job. Okay. Right. Now to the third and final thing. We see that we pray as a response. And we see that we worship as a response. The third thing we do as a response to what we're going through is stay away from pessimism. Stay away from negative thoughts. Oh, man. This is a big one right here. The reason why this here is so big, you know what? I, I just I just saw that I got a couple messages. I got my phone on sound. I need to turn it on. I got a message here from April, April Bailey, and she said this right here. Job was an inspiration to me that you must accept all parts of life, and a part of life is death. In between is where we can't let go. I accepted being a wife, and I acknowledge, and I now accept of being a widow. And what April is talking about is she recently lost her husband, Derrick Bailey Sr., and uh, uh, who was a good, good, good guy. 
And um, so she recently lost him, and she has not let up one time uh, in, in the process. And she says she accepts what Job said. And what April is talking about is, the, is this right here. Job made a statement that he not only accepts the good, but he accepts the bad that comes along with following God. And April said Job was an inspiration to her and, and, and his example that allowed her to make it through. Now, we're going to look at that verse in just a second. And uh, But um, Angela Pryor, she says, maybe that's why we give up on God. Uh, when we have our first tragic tragedy in our life. And uh, and I just don't think I have the strength of Job. You know, a lot of people don't. So surprise, a lot of people don't have the strength of Job. It doesn't mean you got it doesn't mean you gotta give up. It just simply means you may not handle it the way Job handles it. Or it just simply means your mourning cycle may be longer than Job's mourning cycle. But wherever you are on your level of faith, you still don't have to give up. If your faith is weak, that doesn't mean you give up. That just simply means you're going to process the things that happen to you a lot differently, a lot longer. And, and, and it may take you a little longer to get over stuff than it took Joe. But it doesn't mean you have to give up. None of us are the same emotionally. Even if our faith is, is, is strong, emotionally, we're all different. But Job is a good example that any of us can make it through. He's not an example that we're all going to make it just like him, but he's an example that any of us can make it through anything that we face. And that's what's important, you know, about, about the story. But let me look at that verse that, that April kind of hinted to, and it's in Job chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. And this is where, um, this is where, Job's wife came to him and Job's wife was trying to get him to turn his back on God. She told him to curse God and die. Look at verse number nine. Then his wife said to him, do you hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Do y'all think Job's wife was mad when she said that? She said, she told her husband, curse God and die. Curse means saying bad stuff. She was mad. She had just lost all her children. They were dead. So she was mad. But notice what Job's response is. Okay? In verse number 10, Job said to her, You speak as a foolish woman. Shall we not, shall we indeed accept the good from God and not accept the adversity? You see that? Job said, Why is it so easy for us to accept the good when we're following God? When we're following God and good times come and good things are happening, Job said, we're well, hey, okay. But as soon as something bad hits, that's when we get upset at God. Job said, not me. Job said, I'm going to take the good and the bad. Because the same God that I love and who loves me and the same God that shows his mercy and grace on me when times are going good is the same God that shows his grace and mercy on me, on me when times are going bad. So God said, I'm not turning on him. I mean, Job said, I'm not turning on him. Okay, so Angela says this right here. But God knows there was only one Job. Yes, God knows that there's only one Job. Yes. But God does not mean, I mean, but, but God doesn't uh, believe that none of us can't make it through. Yes, God knows that there's only one Job. And there is only one Job, just like there's only one Paul. And just like there's only one James. Just like there's only one Angela Proud, there's only one Tony Elvis, there's only one Jennifer Elvis, there's only a one Andrea Seawright, one Tony Seawright, okay? Yes, yeah, there's only one of all of us. But you know what? Just like Job, we can make it. Just like Paul, we can make it. Just like Jane, we can make it. Just like David, we can make it. Just like Abraham, we can make it. Just like Peter, we can make it. Just like everybody in the Bible who gave their life to God and for God made it, we can make it too. We all may make it at a different pace, but we all can make it. So this, see, and I'm glad, I'm glad these, these thoughts are coming out because that's why staying away from negative thoughts is so important. The third and final thing is so important. You stand away from negative thoughts because the negative thoughts do more harm to us than anything. Okay, the way we perceive and the way we process life, the way we perceive and process things that we go through, that does more harm to us than anything. 
Okay, you go. Like I just told Alexis and Madison, I said, what if I told y'all to go outside and try to jump over the house? And I told y'all don't give up. If they walk outside and look at that house, and the first thing come to their mind is, we cannot do this, they've already defeated themselves. They've already defeated themselves. They might as well come back in. If, if, if a child goes to school and looks at a test and says, I cannot pass this test, they might as well not take it. Okay? We've got to believe that that we've got to believe that we can do the things that 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 we're able to do with God's help. Marcus Harris just put a verse, uh, two chapters on uh, uh, on on the chat, and and he said we find strength through Hebrews chapter eleven and chapter twelve. And Marcus, you're exactly right. I didn't have that in my notes, but Marcus is exactly right. Hebrews chapter eleven is the chapter that people, you know, call the Faith Hall of Fame. But Hebrews chapter 11, let, let's turn over there and look at this because this is a very good point. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and let, let's just read a couple of, uh, a few names of some people, ordinary people just like you and I, ordinary people just like you, Angela, ordinary people just like April, ordinary people just like all of us who went through some things in their life. In Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm not going to read all the verse. I'm going to read some names first because these names are put in here to show you the individuals who made it through, who made it because of faith. In verse 4, we see Abel. In verse 5, we see Enoch. In verse number 8, we see Abraham. In verse 11, we see Sarah. In verse number uh, 20, we see Isaac. Verse 21, we see Jacob. Verse 22, we see Joseph. Verse 23, we see Moses. Verse number um, verse 31, we see Rahab. And now, now I want to start reading in verse 32. And listen how powerful this is. Hebrews eleven thirty-two. 32. And what more shall we say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. You hear that, you hear that, Angela? These people, the Bible says, out of their weakness, they were made strong. They became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and the chains and imprisonments. They were, th they were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, being afflicted, being tormented of whom the whole world was not worthy. They wanted in deserts and mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. All these have obtained a good testimony through faith. All of these individuals endured things in life that you all, you all and myself would never, ever endure, but they were ordinary people just like us, which shows that we can do it too. We can find strength in the life of these people. And the Hebrew writer understood it because in chapter 12, verse number one, notice what he says. Therefore, we also, since we have, or since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we're surrounded by people, men and women, who have stood the test of time. We can look at their lives and see it. And it gives us strength that we too can make it through no matter what's going on. Very good point. Very good point. Look on your sheet or at your question number eight, and it says, what does pessimism equal? And this is my own thing here. Pessimism equals defeat. When you start thinking negative about what you're going through, you're defeating yourself before you even get started. The definition, you don't have to write this down, but the definition of pessimism is this. A feeling or belief that bad things will happen in the future. Or a feeling or belief that what you hope for in the future will not happen. You're defeated already. 
A person who has a negative mind is already defeated. A person who has a negative mind will pray to God, and as soon as they pray to God, they've already said, the Lord did not hear me, and the Lord is not going to answer me. That's a pessimist. you got to stay away from that. you got to stay away from the negative thoughts. Because if you think negative, then you are going to strip yourself of any blessings that you can have in your life. You may ask, you may ask this question here. Well, how do I stop thinking negative about things that I'm going through? When I'm going through something, it, it hits home. That hurts. So how do I think positive about something like that? Well, that's a good question. And the answer to that question is, is number nine, which says, what should we start viewing trials as? It should be trials with an S, but what should we start viewing our trials and the troubles that we go through? What should we start viewing them as? The answer is this right here. We should start looking at them as something that's good for us. As something that's good for us. Now, I know what you're saying. How in the world can something that I'm going through so bad be so good for me? Can y'all answer that question? How, how, how can something that you're going through that's bad, that's, that's bad, that makes you cry, makes you upset, how can that be good for you? Can anybody answer that? Let, 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 let's, let's, let me, let's say you're walking outside in the front yard and you stepped in a hole and you hurt your ankle. And now your ankle is hurting very, very bad. How can that be, how can your ankle hurt and be good for you? What are you going to do next time you go outside? Jump for it. Yeah. Watch out for holes. Why are you going to watch out for holes? So your foot won't hurt. So you'll hurt your foot again. <laughs> you see that? You see that? You walk outside, you break your ankle because you weren't watching where you're going. You stepped in a hole. I guarantee you that pain will make you watch where you're going next time. And I guarantee you, if you, I, even if you step in a hole, it won't be that hole. It may be another one somewhere, but it won't be that one. The pain was a good, the, that pain taught you a lesson. And it's the same thing in our life. We got to start viewing the things that we go through in a good way. And let me show you a verse to prove that, a couple of verses to prove that. The first one is James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Let's turn over to James chapter 1, verse 2 through 3. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 3. James 1, 2 through 3. I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. We got a, we got a real large crowd. We got close to uh, 25 people tuned in. That's almost a whole Bible class. So I appreciate y'all uh, 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 being here. And Jonathan just sent me a, a, a message. And he said it makes you stronger. And you're exactly right. And if anybody else that should know that, it's Jonathan. Because Jonathan, their whole family went through uh, a difficult uh, time a couple years ago. And, and, and still, you know, from time, uh, time to time, I know they have difficult times. But I can see, I can see where, where Jonathan has grown throughout this whole process. And he's living proof that tough times that you go through, it make you stronger. It, it does. It makes you stronger. It's like working out. You know, when you, when, it's just like working out with weights, except... What you're lifting are your trials. And the more and more you lift trials, the stronger you are at battling the trials in the future. He's exactly right. It makes you stronger. Look at James chapter 1. Another thing that it makes you, James 1, verse 2 through 3. Okay, read verse, you got verse 2? James 1, verse 2. Don't start with 4. Huh? Don't start with 4. Right Turn it sideways. So be... uh, James... 1 and verse 2. Okay, read verse 2, then get Lexus, read verse 3. Okay, go ahead. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into driven temptation. Okay, James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Okay, joy, James, is something wrong with you? Did you bump your head? How do I count it joy when I'm going through something? Okay? 
It's how we perceive it. Are you looking for everything in it that's bad, or are you trying to find the good in it? Are you trying to find the real light, the sunlight behind the clouds, or are you just simply focused on the cloud? Okay? That's, that, that's, that, that's what it comes down to. Now, watch verse 3. Here are the benefits of going through stuff. Verse 3. Okay? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. The testing of your faith produces patience. The testing of your faith produces patience. And let me tell you this too. My number was wrong. Uh, there, there are not 25 people. My screen must be different. There are actually 75 people tuned in tonight to the Bible class. And I want to thank all 75 of y'all. I really, really appreciate it so much. And I hope the lesson can help you all tonight. But look at verse number three. The testing of your faith produces patience. You ever wanted patience before in your life? When you go through things and you make it through and you allow God to help you make it through, that gives you more patience to battle the things that you're going to face in the future. That's a benefit. Okay. So instead of looking at the things that you go through as bad, look at them as good. Look at those things as giving you something that's going to benefit you in the long run. Okay, very, very important. The next thing in verse 10, number 10 on your sheet, it says, what do, trial do trials do for us? Here's what trials do for us. They shape our character. Trials shape our character. That's very important. Okay. Um, you know, as parents, and I know those you have children, you would agree with me on this. We wish we could keep our children from everything that could possibly hurt them. I know my mama. I know my mama felt that way. <laughs> my mama wished she could have kept me out of all kind of trouble, but she did the best she could. But she she lost that battle because I was hard, I was hard headed, just like many young people. And still today, the choices we make in life, you know, uh, they shape our character. But the things that my children are going to face in life and go through and some of the things that are going to hurt them are going to make them into better people. It's going to shape their character. It's going to make them into the people that God wants them to be. There are so many verses in the book of Psalms that talk about gold and how gold is burned with fire. And as that gold is burned with fire, all the impurities in it rise to the top to where they can be taken off. And that's what trials are for us. They purify us. They make us into a person that God wants us to be. Put your mouth on. And let me show you a verse to back that up. Turn over to Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 4. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through verse number 4. Little T, he is still here. He's out the picture right now. He's over there on the couch eating. And I'm trying to get him to eat with his mouth closed. He's doing a good job. Yeah. Romans chapter 5, beginning verse 3 through 4. Okay. Watch what this verse is. I love this verse right here. Jim, if you want to read this. Romans chapter 5. Or, uh, uh, read, get that verse for me. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 4. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 4. Y'all watch what this verse is says. Zoria. I, I, got, I got a letter you sent me. I don't think you finished typing what you tried to send. So, see, can you send me your message again that you tried to send me just a few minutes ago? All right, Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Watch, watch, watch this now. Read that, brother. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. You see that? Watch, look at this in verse 3. But we also glory in tribulation. Paul said we glory in tribulation. We glory. Why do you glory in tribulation, Paul? Knowing this, that tribulation produces perseverance. When you go through stuff in life, the more things you go through, the greater desire to persevere you have. Because once you go through one thing, if you face something similar, it's not going to be in a problem for you to make it through it again. You, you gain more perseverance every time you go through something. Perseverance produces character. 
experience. It turns you to the person that God wants you to be. It shapes and molds you into a stronger person, like Jonathan was talking about. And then character produces hope. There are benefits for going through the things that you're going through. You just have to find those benefits and you have to find those good things and you have to stay away from all the bad things. Okay, I can look at what I'm going through as something that's destroying my life and tearing me down, or I can look at what I'm going through as something that's teaching me a lesson, making me into a better person, making me into a wiser person, making me into a stronger person that can help somebody else. It's our perspective. We've got to stay away from pessimism. No, no, no. No, get back. Get back. Y'all have to excuse me. Lil T is trying to destroy the Bible study tonight, y'all. I'm sorry about uh, about the movement of the camera. <laughs> now, number 10 is the last, I mean, number 11 is the last one. And it says, what's the best way to stay away from pessimism and negative thoughts? Here's the big one. And we're getting ready to close it out in just a second. Let me get through this last one. How do we stay away from negative stuff? Turn to Philippians chapter 4. And let me show you. Philippians chapter 4, and let me show you how you stay away from negative stuff. Philippians chapter 4. Uh -huh. What? Okay. There you go. All right, Philippians chapter 4. Now watch this. Paul was in prison when he wrote this. So if anybody knows about staying away from pessimism, I know he does. Okay. Say that. You can say that. Oh no, you have to put it on there. Oh uh, yeah. You have to be. Uh, uh, yeah, that's not for the phone number right there. That's you had to be logged. You had to be logged in on the on the thing. Um, I, I read this was Sister Elvis. I just let her tell y'all. But uh, Angela says. Uh, She says, sometimes people turn away from God. Why do we turn away? Do we turn away because God didn't fix it? I, I think I think that may be the case a lot of times. Just like I told you when we were going over this, uh, the part about praying, I think sometimes we turn away from God because we have an unrealistic view on how God responds to our prayer. And I think I think we as humans... We want God to respond the same, the way we ask, and in a time limit. You know, God, I'm praying for this right here, and I want it done by Friday at 3 o'clock. And if God doesn't come through by Friday at 3 o'clock, then we then we think God let us down. And because of that feeling of letting us down, we lose heart, like Jesus says, and we leave. So, yeah, Angela, I think that's the case. I think people perceive that God did not fix the situation. And that's why they leave. I think a lot of people do it. Other people may have different reasons, but I, I do think that's a large part of it. Um, Jennifer uh, sent this. I mean, she, she wanted me to read this right here. She said, um, shaping our character. She said, I believe how we handle obstacles depend on our faith in God. Our faith should exemplify godly example for others. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a good point, too. What we're going through in life. We should never allow what we're going through in life to cause us to act differently than a child of God. Because people are looking at you and people are going to see how you respond to adversity. And a lot of people, a lot of people could be turned off by it. A lot of people could find you. A lot of people come to your aid and your comfort. But there may be some people who follow your example. And when they see that you broke, they may break also. And so we, we, we stay strong. A lot of times, not just because we're following God and doing the right thing, but for the people around us also who are looking on. April says this right here. She says, stop listening to the people who are not in your situation giving you advice on what you should do because they would do it. Uh, like, like taking uh, marital advice from a singing person. That's a very good point. One of the ways to stay away from pessimism also is listening to people who try to give you advice who are not in your situation. And that's one of the things I want to encourage you all to do, too. If you're not going through, even if you're going through something similar, you're not the same person uh, 
The only advice we should be giving people is this advice that God will give a person. Not something that we think people ought to, to do because we would do it. Sometimes the advice we give based upon how we would respond in the situation may not be the way God would want a person to respond in the situation. Okay, And so uh, it's very important to watch who you get advice from. A person who's a mechanic shouldn't be getting advice from a person who's a heart surgeon. They're, they're, hey, sit down now and, and be quiet. A person who's a mechanic does not need to be getting advice from a person who's a heart surgeon. They're in two different fields. What can a heart surgeon tell a person who's a mechanic unless he's done mechanic work before? So we have to be very careful who we get advice from. But let me go ahead and read Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to start at verse number 6. And I'm going to show you how to be positive in your thinking. Okay. Verse 6 says, be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request be made known to God. So two things from this verse. Pray. And while you're praying, thank God that it's not any worse. Because you know what? It could always be worse. And we're going to skip verse 7 because verse 7 is a result of, of doing what we're talking about. So pray to God. Thank him for everything he's done for you and thank him that it's no worse than it is. And then in verse number 8, watch this. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there are any virtue, if there are anything that's praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You look at verse 8 and you find one negative adjective or whatever in that verse. You don't find one negative thing described in that verse. Everything is in that verse. Everything in that verse is positive. Why? Because in order for you to make it through difficult times, you got to have a positive outlook on life. Having a positive outlook on life and staying away from positive things sometimes means you got to break yourself away from people who put negative thoughts into your mind. Sometimes you got to stop watching negative, prog uh, negative programs on television. Sometimes you got to stop listening to negative things on the radio. Sometimes you just got to break away from the negative magazines. In order for you to keep your mind positive, and you know what? Even if you don't break away, find positive people to be around. Find positive TV shows to watch. Find positive music to listen to. Find positive magazines to read. Find anything around you that's going to make you think positive about life and about your situation so that you can have that perspective on life that's going to help you make it through. If you don't do that, if you allow yourself to be around people and to be around things that's going to make you that are going to make you think negative about life, you will be defeated. So, as we close, what three things do we do to respond to the trials that we go through? What's the first thing we do to respond to the trials we go through? First thing on the sheet that we talked about starts with a P. Pray. Pray. First thing you do to respond to the trials you face in life is pray. What's the second thing you do? What's the second thing you do? Worship. The second thing you do is to worship God. When you're going through things, you don't move away from God. You come to God. That's where you find your strength. Worship. And what's the third thing we do? Stay away from pessimism. Negative. Stay away from pessimism. Stay away from negative thoughts. Stay away from negative people. Find positive things to reinforce your optimism about life. And I'm telling you something. If you respond to the trials you face with those three things there, there are, let me say to this to my audience, I guarantee you a lot of you all out there know a lot of other good things too to go along with what we talked about tonight. I just talked about the three that have, that have helped me. And I'm sure you all have others that have helped you as well. That's wonderful. But if we add these three to the list you already have, I believe it will help us get through the times, the hard times and difficult times that we face um, uh, 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 in life. But um, it is uh, after 8 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and close it down. We are going to continue to do this. I just got to find the right day and time. We're not going to do it on Wednesdays. We're going to do it on a different day and time. And once I get that, uh, set in stone. I'll let you all know through Facebook and through text message and we'll do it on a regular basis. Thank you all so much for tuning in and we're going to close it out uh, with a prayer and uh, and I hope you all have a, a great night. Uh, be safe and a great rest of the week. So let's close it out 
uh, with a word of prayer at this time. Father God, thank you so much for the lesson tonight. Thank you so much for everybody who tuned in. We pray that you would just help everybody as they go through trials and as they go through tough, uh, tough situations. Help us to uh, have the mind to never give up through our prayer life. Help us to have the mind to always want to grow closer to you in worship and help us to have an optimistic look uh, on life. Look, Help us stay away from the people and the things that are going to make us think negative about life. Thank you so much for sending your son Jesus. Thank you so much for all the examples you've given us through the scriptures that help us to know that we can make it. Thank you so much for your love. And in Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. All right. We are out of here. Peace out. Y'all have a good night. Do y'all want to say goodbye? Goodbye. Goodbye. Adios.